Thanks very much. Um, and thanks for the invite. It's, uh, <clears throat> well, it's great to be here, but uh, I guess being here is just at home. Uh, I hope everyone's uh, healthy and happy at home. Um, but uh, what I wanted to talk about today is a phenomenon I call the great AI fallacy. And this is something that came to me when I was trying to work out what's distinct about uh, AI. Um, do, if you've got questions as we go along, put them in the chat and I'll try and keep on an eye on them and then introduce them answers as I'm going through the flow. But the reason I sort of came up with this sort of notion of the great AI fallacy is basically because of this. It's um, this notion that with artificial intelligence, I was trying to work out, I get asked to define AI a lot. And I should say I was a machine learning researcher and never wanted to be an AI researcher. It just turned out that that became the way that AI was working. So sort of overnight, I became an expert in inverted commas AI. And I get asked to define it. And it's difficult to define it because according to who you're talking to, people think of different things. But at some point, I decided that the main thing about AI is that people seem to see it as a sort of servant, a sort of Jeeves type character inside a computer. Um, and that there's something very pervasive about that, which is what I call the promise of AI, which I think is underlying the great AI fallacy. So the general process of history is that when we automate things, we do so in such a way that forces humans to adapt to the automation. Now, what do I mean by that? Uh, so my understanding is we didn't actually have a unified time across the country until we invented the train. And then you had to have a train timetable. And it was important that people in different cities understood time at the same time. Of course, you didn't used to have to go to work all at the same time. You would go when it was light, but then you had factories. And you have to turn up there because the machine needs serving. In fact, Samuel Butler wrote about this in 1863 in the sort of first example of someone talking about machines and, and humans being in service to the machines. The extent to which our lives are dedicated towards serving the machine is driven by the fact that we're very adaptable and the machine is not. And I think what why people are so interested in AI is this implicit promise in it that I think AI is, or people have a perception, it's not explicitly promising to be this, but people have a perception that it's going to be the first wave of automation that adapts to us rather than we having to adapt to it. So meaning by that, finally, we're gonna have a machine that accommodates our whims rather than us having to say, oh, the machine needs fuel, the machine needs cotton, raw cotton, the machine needs um, maintenance, it needs oiling. Um, the sense is that with AI, when people talk about it, certainly in literature, or when you get popular questions asked about it, there's an idea that, no, now finally this entity will understand us. And I think that that's a fallacy. I think that that promise is going to remain utterly unfulfilled with our current systems design. And the fact that it's buried inside us and is implicit in a lot of the decisions we're making around AI is actually pretty dangerous because we're going to deploy this technology more and more widely under an assumption that it's going to do those things. It's going to adapt to us. It's going to accommodate us. When the reality is it's just another example of a great automation technology that relies on humans accommodating the new automation. As another example of this, take the computer. So I think the vision, certainly when I was young, of a computer was going to be, it was going to organize everything for us. You were all going to learn how to program in, in BBC Basic, not on, not on the Apple. I, I used to have a, an Acorn. Um, and we were all going to learn on uh, BBC Basic and automate all those tasks we wanted to automate. And finally, all the tedious tasks would disappear so we wouldn't have to file things anymore, so on and so forth. The reality of the computer is actually we all spend a lot more time doing tedious tasks because the computer can only accept input in certain ways. So cutting and pasting in Excel, sort of very tedious things, moving information around Excel, trying to accommodate the fact that the computer is so brittle um, and doesn't understand what we're trying to communicate towards it. Of course, it's very, very powerful, but it requires us, I would, I would 
hazard a guess. I think in my position 30 years ago, I wouldn't have had to organize my own calendar. I would have had someone doing my filing for me, all these sort of things. Now I do all that myself. I actually quite like doing all that myself, but it means I do a lot more clerical and administrative ordering work than people would have done 30 years ago. So things are actually seem to be going in the other way. Right, so just a bit of context. So uh, answers in the chat, if you uh, know what science is holding. This is science, the statue of science on uh, Holborn Viaduct. She's holding something, which I think is wonderful. Fantastic, James Green got right there, governor. So who invented the governor? Does anyone know who invented the governor? That one harder. <laughs> There's a name, I think it's, it's mainly credited to, ah, Stevenson. It's mainly credited to James Watt, actually. So um, uh, if we look at this engine here, the governor is in place. This is probably 17, late 1780s. Um, it was first uh, uh, included on a lapping engine that Bolton and Watt installed in their Soho works. Um, and the idea for the governor actually came because they were fitting engines to a, a mill in London, the first steam powered mill, it had two engines and three grindstones at each engine. And um, millwrights used centrifugal governors and mechanisms like that to engage the stones as the engine sped up. So you could argue that it was the millwrights that invented it, but there's something particularly important about the way Watt used it. We have the letter from Bolton to Watt where he describes the governor and here's the governor in situation here. And the idea is that these balls go large, go wide as the engine spins up and it moves this linkage and it changes the throttle entry to the cylinder, um, closing it down as the engine overspeeds. Uh, now to me, this is the first example, not the first, probably because there's something else, but it's a very important example of an early intelligent system. It's sensing the speed of the engine through the flyball weights and it's a sort of dynamical system that's opening and closing uh, the weights on the other side. Now, the nice thing about it is that it's a very visible system. So it's a physical system. You could, you could tune the governor by uh, setting these linkage sizes, by setting the size of the balls to ensure that you rapidly achieve the right working speed. If you tune it incorrectly, you get something called surging and surging will be familiar to control engineers because it's the tendency to sort of overshoot the speed, to head towards the speed over too fast, overshoot and then drop back down. Exactly what's gonna happen with the second wave of the COVID virus if we're not careful about how we lift the lockdown, you'll get a sort of surging effect where we're controlling by locking down and then we're releasing the control and then it will go up again and we'll control again by locking down. So it's an early control system um, and it had been around about 100 years uh, in use in steam engines. And you can see the first one in the Science Museum in London from that lapping engine, which I think is 18, 1786. But at some point, James Clerk Maxwell decided to analyze it mathematically. And that's really the foundation of the field of cybernetics. Wiener called cybernetics, cybernetics, because the word cybernetics is the Greek for governor. In fact, the word governor is coming from a distortion of Greek for cybernetics. It means helmsman, steerer. And of course, these systems, these what is effectively an analog computer, were used for autopilots, for auto helm systems, for aeroplanes for many years before we got to the digital computer. What I love about this is you can see everything. Like if you come in and you dismantle a linkage here, there, or, or whatever, then the operator can immediately see something's gone wrong or the engine will start clanking. Of course, the challenge we're facing is a lot of that is becoming embedded. And that's one of the themes of this talk. Another key theme of this talk is, I'll go through this bit quickly, is a difference between the nature of the computer and the nature of the human. So I call this the embodiment factor. And the embodiment factor is a number that represents the degree to which we are locked in. So what do I mean by locked in? Well, this unfortunate gentleman here is a guy called Jean-Dominique Bobby, and he suffered a stroke on his brainstem 
which meant he couldn't control his motor system. And he's here dictating his autobiography, um, which he did over seven months, four hours a day, letter by letter. It became a film called The Diving Bell and the Butterfly. Now, what's nice is we can look at Bobby and we can say, we can look at his rate of communication that he's communicating that. And we can say it's around about six bits per minute. That's Shannon entropy, Shannon information. Now, I think any of us thinks about this locked in situation, different type of lock in from what we're experiencing now, but the inability to communicate, the distancing from other people, the fact that you have a lot of thoughts and you struggle to express those thoughts. Because Bobby has a capability to compute in his head if we look at his computation rate, which is just as high as, as anyone else's. So he can communicate, if he can process bits, at, I bet, well, it's difficult to get a good estimate, but my estimate taken from what it would take to simulate a brain is a billion bits per minute, a uh, billion bits per second, billion, billion, sorry, calculations per second in terms of bits, um, which is the same as us. Now, as a regular human who can speak, when I'm communicating to you now, uh, if I'm using a, a rough regular uh, speaking rate, I can communicate at around 2000 bits per second. So I'm quite a lot faster than Bobby. But if we look to the computer, we know that computers in a minute, they're doing gigabit network. I mean, we're managing to transmit all this video over the internet right now. Computers have moved into the regimes of billions of bits to communicate per minute. But when we compare their ability to compute to us, it's much, much, much lower. It's 100 billion calculations per second versus a billion for Bobby and us. So to simulate our brains, it's approximately you would require the, the Met Office's supercomputer, which is down in Exeter. It costs about 250 million. I think last year when I last checked, it was the 11th fastest machine in the world. Our regular machines are much, much slower. So what I think of as the embodiment factor is to try and estimate using this information, how much time it would take to communicate one second of computation from our brains. Now, Bobby would take with his, he used a system of winking at letters that um, are being shown by his assistant who's doing the writing. If he was to communicate one second of neuronal firings in his head, not the actual thoughts he was having, but the low level thoughts, it would take him 15 trillion years to do so. A computer would take about 20 minutes to communicate one second of all the computations it's doing, it could, if it's operating at full speed in uh, one second. And we're at around 5 billion years. Now, the reason I'm highlighting this is our intelligence is in a very, very different position to the computers. So this thing I call the embodiment factor, yes, yeah, sure, the computer is embodied to some extent. Like it can't share with another computer all the computations it's doing in one second. It would take 20 minutes to do that. So it shares summary measures. But look at us, 5 billion years to all the firings of the neurons that go on in our head. And look at Bobby, 15 trillion years. So we're much more in the same bucket as Bobby than we are with the computer. And this has an enormous number of effects on different parts of our cognition. So if I show you this image and just pause and let you think about it, you could use your context and your understanding and there's very little information there in some sense. Okay, there's an image, but I could take away the image. Um, and I think Shannon, the, the estimate I'm using is 12 bits per average word is what Shannon's estimate for the English language is. And that's the estimate I was using for the previous slide. So what's that one, two, three, four, five, six words. So what's that 72 bits of information. But the story behind it is much, much greater because there's context, there's human context that we carry in our heads. There's our ability to empathize. There's our ability to think of other people. And that inspires things in our heads, which it's very, very difficult to realize in the computer. So most of our conversations with computers are sort of of this form, that we have a model in our heads of the computer. We represent the computer, you have some thought we want to communicate. So we try communicating to the computer. Um, the computer absorbs that <laughs> and then it responds. And eventually it just doesn't work out. 
if we do this with a human, we have an ability to say things to the human because we understand the context of the human. When we're trying to do this with a computer, we don't have the ability to understand what the computer knows. We don't understand what the computer is deciding on, the basis of the information that's making those decisions. So when the computer makes decisions that we don't understand, we have no way of explaining why it's doing that, what it's doing that. And that's for a single machine. Now the wider problem is that we're doing this at scale. We're doing this at scale and many companies around Cambridge are doing that. Sorry, just dealing with background noise. Um, family's having lunch. Um, now, this is really interesting from the perspective of how we attend to this, right? Because in the past, we've had an understanding about how we control what the computer does. We use von Neumann architectures to build these machines where code and data are integrated in memory. But when we build software, we insist on a separation of code and data. And there's actually another architecture that was a rival to what we call the von Neumann architecture. But that architecture was, I think, originates probably more with Turing, and in some sense is just describing what was built in the ENIAC. The Harvard architecture actually stored the data in the software to drive the computer separately. And that's what we try and do nowadays for security. Now, thinking back to the centrifugal governor, if someone tampers with the centrifugal governor, it's quite easy to see what's going on. But I think it's the WannaCry virus that's actually a, a virus that was originally triggered by the, um, an attempt to infiltrate the Iranian nuclear program. And the attempt was to, in effect, uh, manipulate Siemens PLC controllers to overspeed in the centrifugal separators they were using for enriching uranium. So they used security holes and most security holes, not all, but most security holes are of the form of allowing people to inject data into code. Now, being able to inject data into code means you can, Stuxnet, thank you. I was gonna say wanna cry, it was Stuxnet. Stuck that's based on that. So the security hole um, was that you could inject, and they had to use three to get code installed on Siemens PLC controllers so that they could force these controllers to overspeed. Now, unlike the steam engine, you couldn't see when the linkage had been detached because that's now being done in code by injection of data. And the Iranians weren't stupid. They'd separated their nuclear program. They kept the data off the, the systems off the internet but people just dropped USB sticks around the car park and so on and so forth. And then eventually these were used. And I think something like 30% of the centrifuges were destroyed. Now, what interests me about that is that that's an adversarial attack on a system that is designed to keep code and data separate. Well, in the modern world with machine learning, software is data. So that's the kind of whole point about what we're actually delivering. So the promise of AI is we're gonna have these systems that react to who we are and what we do. But the reality of AI is that we're building systems which train on the basis of our data and convert that data into the effective software that the system runs. So this is an extremely high level breach of the code data separation. Now, the breach that went on in um, Stuxnet, thanks Nick again, um, was a breach that required, now my understanding of the backstory, the sophistication of the people who could break into the Siemens PLC controllers, apparently Siemens had laid a lot of people off from that division recently. So the suspicion as to how that happened, because these were zero day um, uh, code uh, security infringements. Um, and there was at least one of those, and I think at least two on Windows to enable this infiltration to happen. So. Adversar adversaries could attack your system when you're explicitly guarding against it. In the world of machine learning, we're talking about deploying computer systems into the real world with 
the software data breach embedded into their core design. I don't think that that's necessarily going to lead to good things in terms of systems that adapt to us purely because we're very, very complex entities. The adaptation we want means that we need them to understand deeply who we are. What I think we're going to get is machines that understand superficially who we are and can be easily manipulated. So I was, I've got a project in this space and I was trying to explain to people what I was working on and, and what the real challenge is here, because I, I see this as a major challenge of systems design. One that I think is unprecedented in the past and is not being addressed or even acknowledged in the work we're doing right now. Um, and part of it is this idea of technical debt, but it's not quite technical debt, what I'm describing. And I was talking to Bill Thompson, uh, who lives around Cambridge, who works for the BBC over breakfast, over a coffee once, and he told me about this. He said, what you're describing sounds exactly like what Jonathan Zittrain calls intellectual debt. And, and it's bang on as the term, it's exactly what I need. So, so this is a Jonathan Zittrain, who's at Harvard, uh, and he gave um, some a talk here recently in Cambridge about this phenomenon. But it's kind of before this, I had a project that was addressing this project, this challenge without knowing this term, but I really like the term. So what's intellectual debt? Well, the notion of technical debt is, is when we deploy complex software systems, um, we deal with a challenge, which is that the system is far too complex for any one designer to have a handle on. So if we think of going back to those mechanical engineers, Watt, Stevenson, these great people of the past, they had this rather nice situation where they could see the governor. They could see how it was moving. If, if someone hadn't fitted a governor to an engine, they could tell that had happened. Now, of course, we're building much more complex systems where the equivalent of governors are feeding into each other and interacting. Um, and no one person can get an overview of the whole system. Um, so what do we do is we go for sort of separation of concerns. Now, technical debt is something that emerges when we try and rapidly put one of these systems together. So the mythical man month is the notion of how you deal with this challenge of trying to understand this, this uh, complex system. I think today we would not use man month, person months, but the idea is the same. This was written in the 1970s. Um, and the idea of the project, of, of this um, book is that as you add more resource to a project, your communication overhead gets higher. And as the communication overhead goes higher, you don't get a sort of linear return and the amount of work gets done. And this is the major reason why a lot of software projects were failing. So the separation of concerns is to separate that project into a set of smaller projects and build individual components. In each of those components, you define what the inputs are, you define what the outputs are, you you allow a team, a smaller team, to manage the design of those components um, and you allow them to go at their own pace. They just have to accept certain inputs and certain outputs. And that's great because it allows you to um, rapidly build systems. But of course, if you don't think carefully about how those components are being built, you build a system that's quite difficult to maintain. And this is the notion of technical debt. So the notion of technical debt occurs when in lean startup methodology, it's pointless building something that no one wants, right? So uh, the minimal viable uh, project idea, product idea, the minimal viable product idea is that let me just get quickly to market with this idea and test the market because I don't want to put a load of thought into my engineering. I don't want to put a load of thought into how I'm going to separate this task into parts so that I can maintain it. Um, until I know the product's successful. Of course, then what happens is when the product is successful, you, you have a lot of technical debt to maintain this decomposition you've built. So that's technical debt. Um, and it's coming from this separation of concerns. Now, technical debt is the inability to maintain your complex system, but intellectual debt is the inability to explain your complex software system. So even if you overcome the challenge of technical debt, even if you're very clever about how you built your system or what you're building on is just a small change over some pre-existing capability, you will end up with intellectual debt because you don't have a in single individual who understands your entire system because you built it through separation of concerns. Because the whole point 
in Frederick Brooks's Mythical Man Month is that you don't want one person who's responsible for the overall design. You're trying to separate that into, into different parts. And this is how we build successfully and to time large scale complex software systems. But we are embedding right in the heart of that intellectual debt. Now, that's true of all software systems we're building, but it's particularly bad. It's a particularly pernicious effect when some of those components are machine learning components, because those machine learning components are now being subject to this great AI fallacy that they're just going to go and adapt to the real world. They're being deployed in much more close, in, in much less controlled environments than we would typically deploy automation of yesteryear. And as a result, we have components, complex software systems being deployed that are responding to user interaction and user feedback in the real world, whether that's social media, whether it's ads clicking, whatever it is, it doesn't have to be, it could be, when I say real world there, obviously that's a, it's a virtual world, but it's one with human beings in it, these highly complex entities. So what do we do about that? Well, I think that this is an incredibly difficult problem. And I think that we're not going to overcome the great AI fallacy um, within the next five to 10 years. I and mean, we're only really fulfilling the promise of the internet now. You go back to say 2000, when people were promising all the things we were gonna deliver on the internet. Well, we are seeing that delivered and we're all experiencing that right now in this lockdown where we've got all these amazing capabilities that um, we could have imagined in the year 2000, but actually now genuinely work. So, you know, I, I, I'm very impressed by how well uh, home video conferencing, for example, is working, the sort of thing we're doing now. But that takes a long time to develop. What's going on with the great AI fallacy is people are promising the equivalent of the internet promises of 2000, which was like, you'll be able to book everything online, you'll buy everything online, you'll video conference and do webinars with your friends. It's taken 20 years to get there. They're promising those, but I think that the core of what they're promising, that these systems will adapt to us naturally, is we don't even know how to do that. But I don't want to sort of say, okay, we're stuck then. I think that there are things that we can start looking at doing. And most of these are, in my mind, inspired by that security analogy. So inspired by what is the best we can do in the circumstances we face, given that we know that people are going are to deploy these things. They're going to deploy, they already have done, they will continue to do so, data-driven components within large-scale software systems. And I think that the first answer is we need to totally revisit the way we're doing classical computer science, software engineering. And I don't have all the answers for how we should be doing that. Um, I think that the, as soon as you accept the core idea that the machine learning is a high level breach of the code and uh, data separation that is sort of taken for granted across our software stack until you get down to the hardware architecture, the von Neumann architecture, where they are sort of combined. Um, as soon as you accept that, you realize you have to revisit an enormous number of the concepts. You don't have to necessarily revisit the stack because we're building this on top of the stack, but you have to revisit the way we're thinking about what we're building. And you can be very inspired. I mean, I really enjoy Ross Anderson's uh, book. I read it even before I uh, moved into the department on security engineering and he takes a very holistic approach to how you have to approach security engineering and i think you have to do the same for your machine learning systems because you're basically deploying them in the real world and they're going to be subject to manipulation from people not just the adversarial of stuxnet but just the mischievous uh, the sort of 11 year old kids are probably your main adversary when you're deploying in the real world so not I, I definitely can't give a sort of comprehensive, this is all the details of the way we can solve this, but I sort of, I've got a few different frameworks I'm using. And one of them is what I, and I was pushing this very heavily when I was at Amazon, what I would call the 3Ds of machine learning systems design. And it's not necessarily particularly um, deep, but it just tries to sort of say, look, think about these three different parts to what you're doing. Now, I'm, today, I, I don't feel I have time to go through data, which in itself, is, is a really critical um, component of how we have to deploy machine learning. 
Um, so I'm just going to do two of the Ds, decomposition and deployment. So decomposition is really what I was just referring to, the need for separation of concerns in uh, building machine learning systems. So one of the things I find most frustrating when talking about machine learning, particularly to very good software engineers, is there was initially a lot of suspicion around machine learning because it's difficult to test machine learning components. So it's difficult to do classical software engineering around how those components are going to um, work in practice because they perform statistically. So writing the right sort of tests is hard. Now, unfortunately, one of the things that seems to have been emerged is because good software engineers have then become obstacles for the deployment of machine learning algorithms, they have now been persuaded largely as a community that machine learning is exceptional and different and that the normal rules of software engineering do not apply. This is a horrific thought. The normal rules of software engineering do still apply. You need to do testing, test-based development, just as you did before, but the nature of those tests will differ. So many of those tests become statistical, verification that the component is doing what it's supposed to be. But people have been persuaded that machine learning is somehow magical pixie dust, sort of as part of this great AI fallacy. And the, the, that persuading is taking very sensible software engineers who are suspending their usual skepticism and judgment because they're picking up on the hype. So you can't just automate all decisions through data. We can't just take a complex subsystem and replace it with a machine learning system. You have to have a good understanding of what data you have available. So even in decomposition, data appears and what models you can use. And in machine learning, that set of models is, you know, has expanded a lot. So we've suddenly gained the capability to have models that can have a better understanding of image, not a human understanding of images, but a better understanding of images can perhaps recognize under certain circumstances what's seen in an image. Um, but understanding what can be automated and what can't is very similar to, and it's just like you can go back to, so what could, automate the sort of control of the speed on the engine. It doesn't mean it's simple for James Watt to then automate a number of other things the engine might be doing, like um, the sort of decisions about when to lift and uh, lower the grindstone or whatever else is going on. Some things are easy to automate, can be done quickly, and some things are hard to automate and can be done slowly. And that needs to be taken into account when you're decomposing your design into separate parts. What data is available that you can readily get and what data can be reconstructed quickly. Um, so careful thought needs to be put into the sub-processes of any given task. You end up having to decompose a task just as you did before, an intelligent decision into just separate components, each of which you might be able to make a simple decision on. So I can think of that as pigeonholing. So you have to think about the decisions you need, the decisions you want to automate, and you have to think about um, what are the subtasks that you can use for those decisions. So can you decompose a decision to a repetitive set of subtasks where inputs and outputs are well defined and you can acquire the data to allow you to reconstruct those decisions mathematically? So are those repetitive subtasks well represented by a mathematical mapping? This is even before we get to intellectual depth, right? This is just, is it sane to start with this decomposition and attempt to deploy what we're describing? So a massive trap I've seen, and this is pervasive as well, is an enormous emphasis on the type of model people are deploying um, and underemphasis on the appropriateness of the task decomposition. So what you tend to hear a lot is, People saying, oh, we're solving this challenge within our supply chain using uh, a convolutional neural network or reinforcement learning, or we're using a recurrent neural network. And that's very often very nice. But the truth is, you want to know is what have I done within my data ecosystem that has allowed me to acquire the data, that has allowed me to decompose the task into this subset, what is the challenge that this model is solving? And maybe today it's being solved by a convolutional neural network or linear regression or something else, who knows? How easy is it to redeploy a new model that's gonna do the same thing? Because today's technology may move forward quickly. It's not about 
I mean, it's great that we've got these new neural network models that can do speech very well, that can do, um, that can do uh, vision very well. But what's much more important is the data flow within your architecture. What is the input to the system? What is the output decision that's being made? It's kind of largely speaking irrelevant what the model is inside. Well, you might argue that it's relevant because you may want an interpretable model. And that's absolutely true. And that would be the, um, the domain of statistics would be focusing on that. But what's going on today is software engineers are being told to solve the task and they're just deploying the model that they think is best. So if you want to control which model is being deployed, you're going to be infringing the separation of concerns and that's going to be a different type of project. Do it by all means. Um, what I'm going to argue for is something slightly different, that you allow those teams to continue to deploy, but you monitor the data flow within the ecosystem that they've deployed and you lift the concern up. You don't break the separation of concerns. But what we're going to argue for later is we lift the concern up and we automate the process of managing the intellectual debt. Because intellectual debt can creep in here, of course, because this is a separate component. A software engineering team can choose to deploy a particular solution and you don't know what they've deployed. So when it comes to explaining the decision making in this subsystem without going and visiting the team that's, that's deployed that subsystem, you can't make a quick judgment on what may be going wrong. And this is how intellectual debt becomes particularly difficult within the sort of machine learning systems design approach. Another really difficult problem is what I call, I mean, there's, I love chicken and egg problems. Um, but in this case, uh, there's a wonderful quote by Popper that says, what's the, what's the solution to which came first, the chicken and the egg? And the, the answer is, he's talking about it in terms of data and hypothesis, but this is just generally the case. The answer is that they co-evolved, right? Neither of them came first. There were entities that were almost identical at one stage, and over time, they separated into slightly different roles. Um, and Coevolution is a fascinating process. Um, it's, you know, us coevolving with our AI systems is going to be the sort of major um, result of, uh, or the, the consequences of AI will be the story of us coevolving with our AI systems. But within the AI systems, um, coevolution is is pernicious. Um, absolute decomposition is impossible because uh, what tends to happen is you're composing these systems together. So if one team deploys a weak model that is doing a bad job, and then that's feeding downstream into another system that is picking that output as an input, um, that downstream system will compensate. So now if you try and improve the upstream component by any measure that you can make without understanding your downstream, how your downstream is uh, reasoning of that component, it's very difficult now to improve that component by objective measures that don't take into account the rest of the system. So you start to lose system um, decomposability. The subsystems, if there's data flowing and if there's machine learning optimizations being done, you get these co-evolution effects. And there really is no simple solution. Um, the, the, the dependence is coming because machine learning systems will make statistical errors and the nature and positioning of those statistical errors will be sensibly compensated by downstream components. And you see that constantly. You, if you talk to someone who's working in a machine learning system, I, I would constantly have people come up to me and say, oh, um, we fixed this component of our subsystem and um, improved its performance magically and deployed it. It was much more accurate. And once we deployed it, the whole system worked worse. Um, and that's very consistent and it occurs because of this, the co-evolution of components within the system. I think I'll skip by data science's debugging analogy. It's a very useful analogy I have for talking to software engineers about why data science is different, but just in the interest of time to make sure we get some time for questions. Uh, I want to skip forward to deployment, which is uh, where these intellectual um, debt problems really start to manifest. So all that stuff you're doing upstream, unless you're doing the decomposition well, you know, you're going to get technical debt, right? So technical debt and intellectual debt. And no one's saying that this is easy. It is hard because 
you're trying to move quickly to deploy a product to test it on short deadlines. And if you don't move quickly, particularly in certain markets, you, you, you've missed the boat. You know, so good luck anyone who's trying to come up with a video conferencing client now. You know, Zoom was in a very good position when this whole uh, thing kicked off and is, I'm sure, doing very well out of it. So it's not just about great product. I mean, VHS versus Betamax, is it's about the product being in market at the right point. But the deployment now has these two problems. One is the technical debt from not taking into account the uh, right level of deployment and the quality of your system will be worse if you haven't done the decomposition correctly. But the other is the intellectual debt. And the premise I have here is that the machine learning we're doing is based on a software system view that is 20 years out of date. Now, what do I mean by that? I mean that in machine learning, as a machine learning researcher, because um, we were often not deploying what we were working on. It was being deployed in, in a few different areas until about sort of 2006. Um, there hasn't been a good connection between the academic machine learning community and say the academic and industrial systems community. I think there's a much better, there's good communications between the academic uh, machine learning community and the industrial machine learning community. There's good communications between the academic systems community and the industrial systems community, but there's not been good cross-connection in academia between those two communities, maybe a little bit in industry. And uh, that has a particular effect because in software systems, we've all moved to these models of continuous deployment. But if you're gonna do continuous deployment for data dependent models, those challenges we were talking about earlier in terms of we're trying to deploy into uncontrolled environments and we have adversaries, the equivalent of a statistical, uh, sorry, a security attack on our system, but now it could be a statistical attack and it may not even be malicious. It just may be a circumstance we hadn't considered because we were over-reliant on the great AI fallacy that these systems could adapt. Um, data dependent models in production need continuous monitoring. They absolutely need continuous monitoring. And that continuous monitoring implies statistical tests rather than classic software tests. You need the classic software tests as well. But very often you're in an advantage because if you're deploying a standard framework, say TensorFlow or PyTorch, you can test that framework and the models of that framework. You don't need to necessarily, um, a lot of your testing is done on, on the libraries already. So probably less classical software tests are needed, although you still need them, but they tend to be more standardized. But you also need these statistical tests. And the statistical tests are particularly interesting because you're going to be trying to detect the equivalent of the thing that happened in Stuxnet. So in Stuxnet, how did they find out something went wrong? Well, the story is that the, the, Iranian, the Iranian nuclear physicists got a bit confused when 30% of their centrifuges exploded, right? So that's a little bit late. You want to detect something going wrong in these subsystems earlier. And that means having standards around how you expect the models you've deployed, your software engineering teams have deployed to be performing. But that means if you want to avoid separation of concerns, having an infrastructure around the models that allows you to understand that. So this to me gets to something I call progression testing. So progression testing is an updated notion of regression testing. Regression testing is testing for backwards compatibility. Progression testing is the need to test for future things I didn't envisage at design time. Now that sounds pretty wild because how can I write tests for things I don't know are gonna happen? Well, we've got a really big advantage. If in machine learning, there's only a limited number of things that a machine learning subsystem can do. It's normally building a mathematical mapping. If we can get software engineers to declare what that mathematical mapping is, we can monitor the data flow through the system and see where decisions are being made and where we may need to deploy tests afterwards. So what we really need is an architecture that allows us to lay out how our system is interconnected and then we can automate the process of intellectual, dealing with intellectual debt. So this progression testing is one component that we need in dealing with the intellectual debt. But what we really need is intelligent systems that are supervising the deployed ecosystem. And the challenge we face to doing that is the lack of a software architecture. So the final thing I'm gonna mention is one of the things uh, we're working on in this space, which is what we call data-oriented architectures. 
So classic software deployment in a company like Amazon is software oriented architecture, um, so service oriented architectures, whereby each of these components is set up by a service within a systems ecosystem. And that systems ecosystem supports and manages those services. And now most recently, a lot of those ecosystems tend to be streaming things like um, AWS Kinesis was one of the things we were using in Amazon, but Apache Kafka is uh, an open source variant. Now, in a data-oriented architecture, that's great because what's going on in the service-oriented architecture is you're trying to make the decomposition occur within the software. So each team owns their software service. They are responsible for persistence of that service and quality and reliability. But in the data-oriented architecture, we go further. We say we want the teams to own the, the data that those services are outputting, the quality of the data. Now, in order to do that, we need to be able to monitor that. So the first thing we're trying to do is we, we've got a version of that was uh, built, started when I was at Amazon and is now open source, is build a framework for monitoring that. So Milan is a general process, purpose steam algebra that encodes relationships between data streams. Um, and it does this in an intermediate language uh, that we call the Milan IL. And it's that algebra um, is something that we can use to study where decisions are being made in the system and deal with the intellectual debt. But it also comes with a Scala library for building programs in that algebra. And uh, we're, it's being worked on to build a Python library for that as well. And a compiler that takes programs expressed in the intermediate language and compiles them for streaming applications like Apache Flink. But the idea is we'd be able to compile it to multiple different streaming ecosystems. And the aim of this is that we can understand the data flow moving through the system. And we get all the way back to that diagram we had of the centrifugal governor at the beginning, where we can see the flyballs, we can see the link, we can see the throttle, we know what's connected to what, we know what's making which part react, and we can start to doing meta-analysis on these very, very complex systems we've deployed. This meta-analysis, I think, is our first and best bet to trying to get on top of the challenges of intellectual debt. So I've hit the 45 minute mark. So um, uh, I appreciate that I've not given as much detail on each of these aspects, but I hopefully I've, you've got a sense of the narrative, the challenges I believe we're all facing some practical ideas about what you can do in your companies if you're looking at deploying these things in terms of these the three d's approach to machine learning systems design and a bit of a glimpse at the future of what we're trying to build which is a software infrastructure for making it easier to deploy these systems at scale and deal with intellectual debt and i'll stop there and take questions if that's okay any questions in the Zoom group chat, I think, is where to put them. Okay, question from Haida Iqbal. As a software engineer who is interested in machine learning and AI, how can I move into machine learning AI career path with traditional software engineering background and no previous ML AI experience? Great question. Uh, so Haida, my answer would be that you, there were a lot of companies um, who were trying to deploy machine learning so there is a big shortage of software engineers who have machine learning understanding. So it's a great time to make this transition. Um, it's of course a challenging time as well because that means that um, a lot of misunderstandings can be brought across into uh, the machine learning systems that are being deployed by software engineers who don't have a deep understanding of, of the machine learning. So I would advise trying to find um, a project in your company, or, or if you're not at a currently at a company, going to work for a company where they are deploying and they have experience of deploying machine learning systems at scale. It can also be a startup company, but you really want mentors in that company who um, have already started doing some of this. Learning on the job, I think, is one of the best things you can do. In order to prepare for that, you can, of course, do Coursera courses on machine learning algorithms and how they work. And of course, you're attending this talk and all that sort of thing. But I think that there's no substitute for doing it in practice. Um, and I think that uh, as you do it in practice, the really key thing is to keep your eyes wide open. Don't take things you're being told at face value, either by the machine learning experts or the other software engineers. 
because really it you know the impression i'm trying to give is this is a new game it's the, the way we're trying to build these systems is unprecedented and um there's a need for innovation in the way we're doing that okay question from mario codero i'm an r d manager cool. facing multiple technological problems each of them consists of dozens of variables interacting simultaneously i'm putting considerable efforts on ai to make my job easier what is the base advice you can give me please Mario, I worry that AI will make your job harder rather than easier. Um, this, this, is, this is one, I think that this is a consequence of the AI fallacy. So when you're saying, and of course it depends on how you're addressing uh, things with AI, there is no substitute for the hard work of getting your, um, whether it is, your project management around those teams you're trying to deploy, or whether it is the systems they're building and the complexity of these things. There's no substitute for getting project management right. And related to the answer I just gave to Haider, a real challenge is in deploying these ML systems. I think that classical agile deployment is uh, a little bit too tuned towards classical software engineering to be fully appropriate for um, some of these machine learning systems. So I tend to dial it back a little bit and move away from Scrum and towards Kanban when I'm deploying these type of things to give a bit more looseness around the machine learning side. What tends to happen is things become very dominated around the software engineering side and less focus on the data and the data science, and that's very dangerous. Um, so that's one thing I would watch for if, if the challenge you're facing is around group management. There's no substitute also for getting more familiar with the groups and what they're doing and getting up close and personal for them. Um, and in the infrastructure, there's no substitute for diving deep and understanding what the quality of your data infrastructure is that they're trying to build on. Because if they're trying to build on something which is poor quality in the base level, it's always going to be really, really hard to um, produce quality outputs. And I th those are the two big gaps I see people missing. One is um, the way that their teams are interacting and bridging from the software engineering to the machine learning and the harmony there. You really want mixed teams in that case. And if you are in a particular domain, you need domain experts spun in there as well. And the underlying data infrastructure. Yeah, and I think unfortunately AI doesn't, that doesn't help. I mean, it, yeah, it, it just hinders because you think you've got an AI solution and it just hides the real problem. Uh, so software engineering has always been a horror and most things get solved by experience rather than design. This is all the way from design of chips to final programs. Most of our problems arise from outside libraries, open source doc, and it's, it's hard to check all of these elements. We're increasingly reliant on activities of other parties. How can we address this? Great question, Nick. Um, that's what we're really trying to do with Milan. And Milan is, we're not trying to be too prescriptive. We're just trying to say, there's this really interesting period where so all this functional programming languages came out, which solved a lot of problems, but it, the sort of genie was out of the bottle. So some of those ideas around algebras being used to um, uh, describe the data infrastructure so that we can start to automate the process of analysis, analyzing that and do so. I mean, in some sense, compilers help a lot with this as well, right? And tools, as you're saying. But there's this real difficulty that the important thing in machine learning is the data flow through the system because that's the software, but that's not being prioritized enough. Most often log files are debugging scripts. They're not producing the sort of data people want to be able to cross check the system. So yes, we're aiming um, with Milan to try and address that. We won't be the only one. And I think one challenge is you need these people who have good experience of industry, good experience of academia and technology, and good experience of software engineering. And as you say, it's going to be outside libraries, open source, and it's it's we're sort of in the sort of 2004, 2003 stage of the internet because that's also what drove us forward with the internet, where we can imagine what those libraries should look like, but we just don't have them at the moment. I think that's a problem at the moment. Um, what challenges, opportunities do you see COVID-19 uh, pausing on AI? Is that, um, I, I'm not sure I can pass the pausing. Um, oh, pausing, ah, the COVID-19 pausing on AI. Um, so I guess the lockdown, how, well, one of the things I think is fascinating 
well, two, two things come up. Of course, it's very, very hard for startups. Um, and that's something that a lot of people are suffering with at the moment. Um, I'm on the AI Council, and the AI Council is consistently trying to push in evidence for what's happening for startups. And my understanding is that the startup, I haven't been involved deeply in that, but there is a startup package. Um, it's, it feels hard to see that we're going to come out with the same. Uh, I mean, if we move into a recession, as one would expect, then it's hard to see the funding levels being the same, but it's not something um, I know too much details about exactly how it's going to pan out. But I think something's really interesting is the extent to which we're seeing that the decision making we've got in society, as wouldn't surprise you, is dependent more on, say, mechanistic models of disease and good statistical analyses than fancy new AI algorithms. And it's interesting the extent to which AI can't help. So a lot of the work I'm doing on COVID-19 is more associated with the statistical mechanistic modeling side of my experience, less associated with my understanding of the type of systems we're talking about now. And I think that's just because it, like the internet wouldn't have helped that much in 2000. I mean, it would have helped a bit, but not to the extent it's being there. And I think those technologies aren't quite mature enough. So this is from Mikhail. Um, thanks, Neil, for a really thoughtful open talk. Thank you. Um, do you see particular challenges in decomposition deployment tasks you outlined for federated models of learning which are emerging? Really great question. I think that that's, um, as soon as you start, I haven't talked about privacy. So federated models, just uh, for clarification, is where you deploy some of your machine learning down to um, uh, devices. So most of what I was talking about was actually implicitly assuming that you're going to control your machine learning centrally in the cloud. Um, I think it's a great question. I probably don't have to, uh, time enough to answer it well now, but just um, to throw a couple of thoughts in there, I, I think there's challenges and sort of opportunities as well. Um, I'm very excited about the extent to which I hear um, quite serious big companies like I believe Apple and Cambridge work on this uh, at the interface of federated and uh, sort of differential privacy and privacy aware learning. I know Google also work on that. Um, I think that these two ideas can be merged because um, I think that the federated learning becomes, I know it's being distributed across a lot of phones, but it can also be seen as a single component in this composite picture I'm speaking of as ML. But the truth is that I'm just speculating and the truth of the, the proof of the pudding will be in the eating, like all this stuff. You only understand the problems when you try and deploy them in the real world. And it's when we start to try and deploy such systems that we'll start understanding exactly the challenges there. Really interesting question. I feel I just rambled and didn't give you a very clear answer. Um, yeah, the term, this is from Wan, uh, the term AI and ML used interchangeably. Isn't it misleading when a majority of discussion is really ML and not so much AI? I totally agree. And, uh, in some sense, this has become quite problematic. I feel I entered the field as a machine learning researcher because I was interested in solving problems. And um, I started as an engineer, a mechanical engineer actually, and I saw an opportunity with these techniques to solve problems I couldn't solve any other way. Um, there's this rather odd effect that as a community, I mean, the AI community was totally separate from us for many years and wasn't doing data-driven stuff. I, I stem our origins much more towards the cybernetics community, which predates the AI community and uh, controlled engineers and signal processing. Um, and now that we seem to have co-opted this term, it's got some advantages in terms of societies very interested in technology, which I think is a genuinely a good thing, but it's also brought this sort of weird hype that um, it, when you say not so much AI, you might be meaning like AGI, you know, uh, artificial general intelligence and stuff like that, which never really interested me. I, I have opinions and thoughts on it that I can express, but that's because I've been forced to do so because I'm a machine learning researcher. And at the moment, as you're implying, machine learning has become AI. Um, I think we're just over 1.30 time. Uh, so, and I think I've covered all the questions. So unless there's anything else or Sarah, do we want to, how do we want to proceed next? Yeah, no, it looks like the end of the question. So 
think we might have to say goodbye at this point. And thank you, a huge thank you for giving up your time over lunch. I hope you haven't missed it um, to give the talk for us. That's been absolutely fantastic. Um, and to everybody who's listening, oh, Claire says thanks. <laughs> to everyone who's been listening, we have got a recording of this, hopefully, as well. Um, so you'll be able to catch up with it on our YouTube channel. Neil, thank you very, very much for the time. Great pleasure. Thanks for organising. Sorry we don't have wine afterwards in the computer lab. But, I know. Um, but, uh, I know. I guess you're all, you can all go and have a glass of wine on your own now. I don't know. <laughs> we'll have to do wine and virtual networking. <laughs> Hopefully we'll all meet one day. <laughs> Brilliant. I hope it wasn't too uh, garbled and rushed. There's lots of stuff online for people who want to know more. Um, you can check my blog posts. You can, um, and there's more details. There's a, uh, if you search Neil Lawrence talks, you'll find I put all this up as a set of notes with additional links so you can dig deeper into any of the things I spoke about today. We can send that round as well if you like. Brilliant. Excellent. Thanks Thank you very much, much everybody. <laughs>